Good afternoon and welcome back to Stories with Don. Reading one more story by uh, Patrick F. McManus today. Um, and this one is from his uh, compilation called Never Sniff a Gift Fish. And the story itself, the short story is called The Night Grandma Shot Shorty. When I was a boy, we kept a loaded pistol in the house with which to dispatch criminals who might come prowling around late at night. We never killed any criminals with the pistol, but there was one near fatality. Unfortunately, the victim was not a criminal, at least so far as we knew. The caliber of the pistol was very large, at least 45, maybe 50, and magnum to boot. The pistol could put a hole in you the size of a grapefruit if you were a criminal trying to force your way into our house late at night. At least that's what I told the guys at school. What I didn't tell them was that the gun was a figment of my mother's imagination. My father had died when I was six, leaving me the lone male in a family of women. My mother and grandmother and a sister who was six years older than I. If I have never become too excited over women's liberation, it is because I grew up surrounded by liberated females, all tough, hard, and fearless. Any one of them could have taught a graduate course in assertiveness training. My sister held a black belt in aggravation. Our farm was situated about a mile from the railroad and it was not unusual for tramps to stop by and ask if they could chop some wood in exchange for a meal. If they, my mother, bless her heart, never once turned away a tramp unfed, but boy did those suckers chop wood. There were no free handouts at the McManus farm. Even with all the tramps drifting into our place, staggering away three hours later with a bologna sandwich clutched limply in hand, Mom never saw any need for a gun as a means of self-protection. After all, she viewed the tramps as harmless, easy-going fellows, who, if spoken to with the proper measure of firmness, were capable of chopping a good deal of wood. Then one day, my mom went into town and hired three local criminals to build an extension onto the chicken house. When they were about half done with the project, she saw they had no skill as carpenters, paid them off and sent them packing. We'll get you for this, one of the criminals, a mean little man called Shorty yelled back over his shoulder. Ha, mom responded. The threat, however, caused some concern among the rest of the family. What would we do if Shorty came sneaking back in the middle of the night, intent on murdering us all? Oh, all right, Mom said. Here's what we'll do. She explained that if we heard any strange noises outside at night or someone banged on the door, my sister would sing out loud and clear, Do you want the gun, Ma? Do you want the gun? To which my mother would loudly reply, Oh, you'd better give it to me, but be careful, it's loaded. The system worked rather well. Not only did the imaginary pistol frighten off any criminals making strange noises outside our house, but it gave several innocent late night visitors a bad case of the shakes. In fact, the imaginary pistols turned out to be more deadly than any of us expected. One night, my mother was sitting up alone playing a game of, a game of solitaire when suddenly there was a banging at the door. Mom, who never thought the imaginary pistol was necessary in the first place, got up and answered the door without bothering to wait for my sister to sound the alarm. The visitor turned out to be a diminutive young fellow by the name of Little Ernie, and he had a terrible tale of woe to tell. He had joined the Civilian Conservation Corps that summer and had been working with a CC crew back up in the mountains eradicating blister rust, which is a tree disease. Somehow, little Ernie had managed to antagonize the rest of the crew, and they had taken him down and shaved off all his curly blonde hair. 
He had left the camp in a huff, his cowboy hat wobbling loosely atop his ears. As he, as he recited the story to Mom, his voice rose and fell, quivering with rage. He also refused to remove his hat to allow Mom to survey the damage. In that time and place, it was considered the ultimate rudeness for a man to wear his hat in the house. This was to be a contributing factor in the misunderstanding shortly to follow. After one last outburst of rage, little Ernie pounded the table with his fist. Mom was getting tired of hearing about the atrocity, and she told Ernie he could spend the night in the spare upstairs bedroom. She then went off to bed herself, neglecting in all the excitement to mention to Ernie that another upstairs bedroom was occupied by my Aunt Gladys, who was visiting, and Graham. When the banging on the front door had first sounded, Aunt Gladys and Graham had sat bolt upright in bed. Soon they heard a loud male voice full of rage and incoherence. It's Shorty, Graham hissed to Aunt Gladys, who had been told about the threat. Aunt Gladys went pale and her hair tightened in its curlers. We better go get Mabel, she whispered. They listened a bit longer to the mad ravings rising from the living room. Then they heard the dull sounds of blows being delivered. My God, he's killed her. Graham gasped. After a period of silence, broken only by the tinny rattle of hair curlers, they heard booted feet beginning to ascend the stairs. Ho, oh, Aunt Gladys whispered. Now he's coming for us. Through the open door of their bedroom, Graham and Aunt Gladys had an unobstructed view of the stairwell. Thump, thump, thump came the booted steps. Given their emotional state, it was perhaps understanding, understandable that Graham and Aunt Gladys would mistake the slow plodding of the steps to be the result of stealth rather than weariness and nervous exhaustion. Slowly, the crown of a cowboy hat rose above the edge of the stairwell, a sure sign the intruder was a killer. No one else would wear a hat in the house. Then the head and shoulders came into view. There was only one thing to do. Graham drew the Im imaginary pistol. Employing the tone of voice she reserved for breaking up dog fights and ordering the family hog out of her flower gardens, she let er little Ernie have it. Hold it right there, Ernie, or shorty, she snarled, or I'll blow your head off. Three days later, little Ernie had recovered enough to be ready and willing to go back to the CC camp. By then, if he held a cup in both hands, he could get it to his lips without sloshing coffee all over himself. Much of his color had returned, too. Since the stubble of his hair had leapt half up half an inch when he heard Graham's command, he now looked as if he had a crew cut, although it was somewhat lighter in shade than his original blonde curls. We never saw little Ernie again, so I don't know if he ever fully recovered. Perhaps he was still peeved at Graham, thinking that by calling him Shorty, she had been referring to his modest structure. Mom got rid of the pistol soon afterwards. She said it was too dangerous to have lying around the house where a young boy or an old lady might get hold of it and accidentally kill somebody. So that's the end of that story hope you enjoyed it um well that's it for for patrick f mcmanus um since tomorrow is thanksgiving i won't be doing a, a story tomorrow or on friday so two days without stories but i will begin next monday and we'll begin uh reading um the chronicles of narnia and that should be good all right, and that will go for a while because there's like seven books, I think, in the series. So that's what we'll be reading starting Monday. In the meantime, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving tomorrow, that you are able to stay well and don't eat too much. And may God bless you. Goodbye.